church. All right, let's get down to what I want to talk to you about today. Last week, I shared with you about sheltering in place. You know, that's, that's what people say is the, the way we've got to do it now. SIP is what they call it, SIP, shelter in place. We've got to stay in our homes. We're not going to most be. I, I heard someone tell me last night, I didn't believe this, but, but they told me that there was a person, I think this was in, well, I better not say because I'm not for sure where it was, but it was right here locally, uh, not in our city, but another city locally, that they were actually pulled over because they, the police officer said, I want to see if you've got a, a mask, a face mask to, to wear. They weren't wearing it. They were in their own car, and they were pulled over for that. I, I, I've heard the governor of California say, you know, this is going to be our new way of doing things. You may go into a restaurant, and they'll check your temperature before you go in there, and you'll, you know, the waiter may be wearing gloves and, and a mask and have disposable, uh, uh, disposable menus. Uh, they say, this is going to be our new normal. Folks, I, I know they say that, but I'm, I'm not ready to, to settle for that. No, I'm not talking about breaking the law and endangering people. This is a serious thing, and we've got to, we've got to do what we've got to do. But I believe we're coming out of this. I, I believe there will come that day. I heard Dr. Fauci say, you know, we're probably never going to shake hands again. Well, I, I tell you, we're going to shake hands. We've been through things like this before. And I'm not belittling the, the seriousness of where we're at. Don't misunderstand me. But we've been through stuff like this. We've been through influenza, influenza here in our country where literally thousands, thousands have died, way more than what we have seen succumb to this. And we got through it. I mean, you can go back to the turn of the century, the Spanish influenza. You can, you can uh, go back just a few years uh, to predictions that we remember when Ebola was there and we thought, oh no, everybody's going to die from that. And, and we made it through that. We're going to get through this. I have faith in God. I have faith in, in this country. I have faith in, in the science that God has given us. We're, we're getting answers. We're going to come out of this and we're going to be able to go back to church. And we're going to sit and worship together. And I can't wait till that happens. We're going we're gonna to go to movies, we're going to go to theaters, we're going to go uh, eat out. We're going to get back to that. It's just a pathway and a process to get there. But what the, what the challenge is, is if we're not careful, we'll allow this mindset, and I talked about this last week, and so let me just review a little bit. The devil wants you to shelter in place, not just in your home. He wants you to shelter in the place of fear which leads to doubt, which leads to despair. And that's what the devil wants your new normal to be. I hear that all the time. This is going to be the new normal. This is, this is the way that it's got to be right now. Well, let me tell you, God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I'm going to take the precautions. I'm going to do what I need to do, but I'm not going to let it impact my faith in God and what I believe that God can do. I'm not going to allow the devil to have me in my spirit shelter in place. Instead of that shelter in place, that SIP, I've got a new abbreviation that I want to give you. It's not SIP, it's S-I-H-P, shelter secure in his promise. I'm secure in his promise. And for these next several weeks, I want to be sharing with you those promises that I'm secure in. Because with so much doubt that is out there, so much despair that is out there, so much fear that is out there, then we need to know exactly, exactly where we're at. So today I want to talk to you about I'm secure in his power. Say it to somebody right there. Come on, you can talk to somebody right there. Say, I'm secure in his power. Matter of fact, let me just see. Can, you get, can I get an amen here on the chat page? Can somebody just say, amen, I'm secure in his power? I'm not going to preach to you say, there's an amen. I'm getting an amen there. I'm secure in his power. That's what I want to talk to you about today. And, and, and people are saying, amen. There we go. There we go. See, that's the way we do it. I want to go to a story in Luke chapter 8. And hopefully you got your Bibles there with you close by. Uh, you're at home. Hopefully you got a Bible there at home. If not, then we'll put it up on the screen like we always do. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So, that, so they got into a boat and they set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, 
rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they ask one another, who is this? Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I'm going to pray right now. I believe God's going to speak a word to us. Father, thank you for each one that is sitting there in their home or in their car or, or at, 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 a, at a group home or, or wherever they may be. God, you're about to speak a word to us. You're about to come to us right now, not, not physically, but you're going to come to us in our spirit. And I believe you're going to speak a word, an individual word to someone right now that is sheltered in place, not just in a physical location, but they're sheltered in fear and doubt and disbelief. God, we want to be secure in your power today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, okay, keep your Bible open. I just want to walk through this, this verse. It won't take us long today, <laughs> he said. Uh, it says one day, start right at the beginning, one day. See, there's going to come a day when your faith is going to be tested. That's going to happen. It may be today. It may be tomorrow. Well, I think for all of us right now, that day has come. That one day, Jesus said to his disciples, you will know, see when that day comes. Here's when you're going to know is because Jesus is going to speak to you. It's not going to be the voice of man. It's not going to be an audible voice from God. I'm not saying that. But you're going to know, hey, God's doing something in my life right now. God's trying to get my attention. And maybe right now during this time, God is saying, hey, this is the day that I want to get your attention and I want to give you direction. See, you need to stop listening to what man's trying to get you to do. You need to start listening to what God is wanting you to do. Because this is where your faith then is tested. Jesus said to them, let us go to the other side of the lake. See, you'll know it's a step of faith when God gets you out of your comfort zone and moves you to the other side, moves you to an area of the unknown. Now, I've I've been at this area. I've been where they say that this is where he would have launched from there in Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and he would have gone over to the other side. And that was an area that really was not all that friendly uh, to the disciples. So he said, I'm going to take you into new territory. Maybe today God is telling you this is the day that I want to get you out of your comfort zone. Hey, we've gotten out of our comfort zone. Things are not the way that they normally are. When things are are normal, we get comfortable in them. And God says, maybe I want to shake you up a little bit. Maybe I want to change your schedule a little bit because I'm trying to get your attention to take you to the other side. I want to go to the other side. I want to go to where miracles are at. I want to go where God wants to do something because I know he always does greater things in my life. So I don't want to stay on this side. I want to get in the boat and go to the other side. Tell somebody I want to go to the other side. I like this in this verse. It starts off with those two words, let us. Jesus is never going to send you somewhere by yourself. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. If he's going to send you to new territory, if he's going to send you to a new place, just understand this, he's going to be right there in the boat with you. The verse continues. So they got into the boat and they set out. You're never going to get to the other side to where God wants you until you're ready to get in the boat. I know a lot of people that walk up and down the the shoreline say, oh yeah, one day, someday, maybe I'm going to. Oh, I'm going to do it this one of these days. And you never do anything. You always talk about it, but you never do it. I'm going to get involved in ministry. I'm going to help people. I'm going to share the gospel with somebody. I'm going to be praying for people. I'm going to you do all that. So we got a Bible college here, SUM, School of Urban Ministry. It is, it, is, it is right now doing so well because, let me just tell you, we're, we're way ahead of the curve. For a lot of people have been going to classrooms, well, they can't go to classrooms right now. They, they can't do that. But the chancellor of SUM, decades ago, he said, you know, we need to have something that we can connect people together. Now, we, we still have those virtual classrooms, some of the greatest teachers. So this is a college, a Bible college, that we're not having to get up to speed. Why? Because somebody went to the other side a long time ago. Somebody said, hey, we're going we're gonna to get in the boat. We're going to follow the leading of God. And if you're out there and you feel a call of God on your life, because I think that's what maybe God's going to do to some of y'all. I think some of y'all are now starting to see, you know, I thought I was going to follow this career and I was going to follow that career and all that. And now God said, you ain't doing nothing, but you're going to set it home. Maybe God's trying to get your attention to say, now you need, you need to engage in the calling that I've given you. I want to take you to the other side. 
If you want information, go to our website. There you'll find about SUM, and you can enroll. Uh, people are enrolling now. So why is everything shut down? We're not shut down because we were already ahead of this thing. So again, if you feel a call of God in your life, go to our website, SUM. You'll be able to find it right there and get all the information. And, and Cody would love to talk with you about that. So they got in the boat and they set out. You got to get in the boat and you got to set out in that direction. It says, as they sailed, he, speaking of Jesus, he fell asleep. I, your problems may be keeping you up at night, but they're not keeping Jesus up. Not wor- he's not worried about it. Oh, man, this is a serious problem. What are we going to do? And I don't know. And I'm not taking anything away from the seriousness of it, but, but Jesus ain't losing sleep over this because he knows the end from the beginning. How could you sleep through that? Well, it's because he's got faith, and he wants you to have faith, and he wants you to, to recognize you're in the palm of his hands when you're following after him. So here are these disciples. They get in. They head to the other side. Jesus says, I'm going to go take a siesta. I'm going to go take a nap. And he goes and does that. So what happens during that time? What happens during that time where now Jesus is not visible? He's asleep, one version says, in the hinder parts of the boat. He's back in the back of the boat. It says, a squall came down on the lake. Now that word squall there, NIV, King James calls it a storm. Uh, This, some translated hurricane, a strong wind, a whirlwind. This was a huge storm. And I've been out on the water before. We got a big lake where I was growing up. And one time we were out on it in a pontoon boat and we were there with the family. And there was, there was a big storm that came up. And it was like, are we going to be able to make it back? I mean, out of nowhere, those clouds rolled in, because you can have that in northeastern Oklahoma. Those storms will roll in real quick at the end of the day. And I mean, the wind got up and it started to lighten and starting to rain. And that's, that's what's happening right here. It came without warning and it surrounded them. Is that not the coronavirus? I mean, out of nowhere, think about it, three months ago, would you have ever thought we would be where we're at? It, what was it? Less than um, two months ago or right about that, I was at Disneyland. I, I was riding a Star Wars ride. We were having the time of our life. And it was just, I mean, just days after that that they shut everything down. There was no way I could imagine. I'm I'm, I'm riding the churro ride. I'm riding the the turkey leg ride. I'm I'm riding the the cotton candy ride. I'm riding all the fun rides that I ride at, at Disneyland. And who knew that just a few days later they'd shut everything down. We didn't see this storm coming. Nobody predicted that we would be where we're at. And this thing has surrounded us. That's what happened to the disciples. Now they're surrounded by this storm, and it says so that the boat was being swamped. Now, what that literally means is that water was coming in the boat. Well, I'm not much of a boatsman, but I do know this. Water on the outside, dry on the inside. Well, this water was coming in, and you know what happens when the water gets on the inside of the boat, it fills up and the boat begins to sink. (laughs) You know you're in trouble when what's on the outside is now on the inside. When the things that you tried to keep out now have come in. And, 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 And instead of the security of where you're at now, everything seems to be upside down and everything seems to be flooded. And and now all you're doing is is bailing water. To try to, to try to stay alive. That's where these disciples were. And here's the thing that says, and they were in great danger. It just doesn't mean they were going to get wet. It doesn't mean that they were going to mess up their, 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 their good-looking shoes. No. They were in danger. They, they said, this is something that we could lose our life. This could be the end. And, and these, again, these, these disciples were professional fishermen. Many of them were. They'd been out in storms before, but this had got them to the point that they said, wait a minute, we're in this storm, our boat is filling up, and we're in great danger. Now, let me just get very quickly to what what I want to tell you today. Here's what they did. And if we're going to be secure in his power, we need to do the same things. Number one, when the devil has got you full of fear and doubt and despair, remember who is on your boat. Well, of course, no, we forget that. We forget that God is with us. I mean, even though the text does not specifically say that, I've got a feeling that Matthew and Mark and Luke, John, whoever was on there, Peter and James, they were sitting there and they were talking and everything. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Get the life vest, get the water. And somebody said, duh, 
Jesus is here. He, he's asleep back there, but he's a here. I want to tell you right now, Jesus is here. He's right there with you in the middle of this storm. You are not alone, but you have got to remember that. You got to bring that to your con. You need to say, hey, Jesus is here. Jesus is in my boat. Your boat may be different than my boat or the other person's boat or what specifically that you're going through, but hey, we're all in the same storm. Matter of fact, why don't you just chat that to me right now? Just say, Jesus is in my boat. Why don't you make that declaration? Why don't you let the devil know? Just, just print it out there. Jesus is in my boat. I want the devil to know that you may be in the middle of a storm. It may look like you're going down. Yeah, some of y'all are doing that right now. You need to declare that. Jesus is in my boat. I'm not alone. Now, the next thing it says that they did, that the disciples then went. They went. So you've got to know where Jesus is at. And the way that you know where Jesus is at is you've got to remember where you left him. Jesus didn't leave you. But I'll be honest, there's been some times I've left him. Sometimes I said, no, I'll go do it my way. I'm going to get off on my, my own pathway, and I head out that way. And, and when I turn out, where are you at, Jesus? Jesus says, I'm not going that way. Go, if you're going to do that, go on with your big bad self. You've got to remember where you left him. Maybe you got distracted by the things of life. Maybe you were pursuing your career. Maybe you were pursuing this and that. And in all honesty, you got out there, and, and you said, where's God at? And I've lost God. And maybe that's what this storm is going to do. It's going to refocus you on the reality. Now, I can't be out there and all that. Maybe now I need to focus and remember that Jesus is with me. If you get close to him, he will get close to you. So get back to him. The Bible says, return to your first love. Remember what it was like when you first found Jesus? Remember how excited you were to know that your sins had been forgiven? To know that now you saw the truth, you saw the way, you, you had the life? And then the cares of life came and the situations, and now it was, oh, no, we got to go to church again. You remember, you used to be excited about going to church. And now some of you are saying, oh, I wish I could get back to church. Well, maybe this is something God's saying, yeah, I needed to put you in a little bit of a storm here so you would recognize that. What did they do when they went to him? They woke him up. They woke, turn to that person that's going to sleep right now, nudge him there and say, hey, wake up. Preacher's talking right now. Wake him up. I wish I could do that to some of you in church on Sunday mornings, but, but at least I got some help right now. So, so just wake them right up right there. It says they woke up. That word wake up means to awake, to arise, to raise, to stir up. I'll tell you a story about my dad. Had a great dad, but I, now I understand more about my dad now that I'm, I'm a lot older. My dad died when I was uh, just in my late teens. And he would come home from work. He's a, he, he, he worked uh, a lot of physical labor. He worked for an electric company. He was a lineman, did a lot of stuff. He was a rancher. He, he was a farmer. I mean, built houses, did all kinds of stuff. So when he would come in, we'd be sitting there watching TV after mom made uh, dinner, and, and he'd get on the couch. I can see that couch over on Chickasaw Street, that white house we used to live on the corner. And uh, Wayne Marvin lived right up the street from us. And uh, Patty lived across the street, and she was a runner-up in, in Miss Oklahoma at that time. Just a little bit of my history. And uh, so he, he would go to sleep, and I remember one time Mom wanted to wake him up, and she, she was hollering, Jim, Jim, and Dad wasn't hearing it. My dad's name was Jim, too. And uh, I said, I got an idea. I'll wake, let me wake him up, Mom. Let me wake him up. And so I went over and got behind the couch, kind of stuck my head up over the couch, and I screamed, Fire! Fire! fire boy my dad woke up he jumped up i mean he started looking around he got into that 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 mode of i gotta protect i gotta do all these things he began to look all around everything and suddenly he heard me laughing and that was about the last time i laughed because <laughs> my dad about what i mean he disciplined me in a proper fashion that i will not forget and he said son you don't do that well i don't i don't think the disciples did that but they woke him up i think they screamed I think they said, oh, we're, we're perishing. We're going to sink. We're going down. Jesus, you've got to do something. See, there's difference when you call out in your time of need. See, some of y'all before, oh, yeah, I need Jesus. I, oh, I need Jesus. Well, some of y'all are not saying, oh, I need Jesus. Some of you say, oh, Jesus, i got to have some help right now. I'm locked in with my family. They're driving me crazy. I don't know where the food's at. We're running out of toilet paper. I'm being facetious. But the reality is some of you really have gotten to that panic, that point that you're really crying out to God. 
And that's what these were doing. And, and when you cry out to God, it woke him up. G it gets Jesus' attention when you begin to do that. Like the blind man. When Jesus was passing by, he cried, Oh, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus will always hear your cry. He won't listen to your games. He won't listen to you when you're, oh, maybe, could be, whatever. No, but he, when you cry out to him in need, he hears your cry. And, and they, aw they awake, wake, he, he woke up. That's a way to say it. It, 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 it stirred him up. And then what did they call him? And this is the key. If you don't get anything else I've said, catch this. They, they called him master. Master, master, we're going to drown. They didn't call him teacher. They didn't need a lesson right then. They, they, they didn't call him friend. They didn't need a friend right then. They called him master. That word master means that we're putting you in control. See, some of you have had Jesus as your co-pilot. Well, he ain't going to be your co-pilot. Some of you have had him as your advisor. Yeah, he, he doesn't just give advice. Some of you have had him as that friend. Well, he, he is that friend, but no, what we need to make him in our life is our master. Because if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And maybe that's some of our problems that we've brought Jesus along for the ride. And Jesus says, no, I ain't going with you no more. Either you put me in control of your life, either you make me the master of your life, and maybe during this time when the devil is trying to bring in fear and doubt and despair, maybe this is the time Jesus is saying, you know what, in this time that you've got fear and doubt and despair, why don't you call to me? Why don't you put me in control of your life? Some of you need to do that. Not religion, but a relationship with God. So they remember Jesus was on the boat. They went to where he was. Get back close to God. Draw an eye to me and I'll draw an eye to you, God says. They, they called out to him. You got to call to him. You got to ask. Ask and you shall receive. And then what did they do? They called him master. Well, what did he do? It says he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. He got up and took control of the situation. Why? Because they had put him in control of the situation. Don't, he didn't sit idly by. He engaged. He rebuked the winds. He, he, he told the water, get out of this boat. He put things back in order. Now, I don't know how long this virus is going to last. I don't know what, what tomorrow holds, but I've said it every week. I know who holds tomorrow. And I put him in control. I can have peace in that. I can be secure in his power. What happened? Then the storm subsided and was all calm. Let me ask you, are you ready for the storm? To stop in your life, put Jesus in control. He can do that. You can stand secure in his power. Let me read you a final verse. Luke chapter 8, what happened? When the calm came, Jesus said, where is your faith? Where's your faith at? That's what he asked the disciples. Where's your faith? You're, you're all fearful and full of doubt and despair. I think Jesus would ask us, where's your faith at? Isn't this why you've been going to church? Isn't this why you've been reading your Bible? Isn't this why you've been praying? Isn't this why you have a relationship with me? That in times like this, you don't have to panic. You can have your faith in God. Where is your faith? And it says, in fear and amazement. So, well, see, they got fear. No, that word fear there means reverence. They finally understood who Jesus really was. It says, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? Who, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And can I just say right now, let me just add another thing in here, and I don't want to add anything to Scripture, don't want to get in trouble. But who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and the coronavirus. And they obey him. God is in control, folks. God is in control. Let me, let me close with a story. Today's my daughter's birthday. Today is my daughter Jessica's birthday, and we were having a party for her last night, and we were thinking about the day she was born. Oh, it was, it was one. She's my firstborn. She was my first child, Cindy and I, we wanted to, we waited for a while to have children. And so she came along. Oh, we're so excited about that. She was born in Tahlequah, Oklahoma at, at the Hastings uh, Indian Hospital there. We're all Cherokee Indian. She's a card-carrying member of the tribe. 
And boy, things were so wonderful. My folks were there, Cindy's folks there. We were all excited, just as you can imagine, the first grandchild. And, and they brought Jessica in, and Cindy was there feeding her. And this was, the, this, I think, just hours after she had been born, and that, because she was born early in the morning, and so it was that next day. And we were sitting there, and I'll never forget, the nurses came in. And they said, we, we need to see your daughter. Well, okay. I, we've never been in the hospital like that before. Okay, that, that's norm. But I could tell by the look on their face that something wasn't right. And they hurriedly took Jessica away. And, 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 and so now we're asking questions. And the doctor came out just a few minutes later and said, we've discovered something. Uh, her intestines have not formed properly. There's a blockage there. They didn't grow together. They, they actually, they're blocked. And now what we've been feeding her is beginning to back up. And she's in serious problems. We need to get her to a, uh, a children's hospital as quickly as possible. We were about 45 miles, about an hour from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this was so serious, they said, we can't even use an ambulance right now. We've got to life flight her. We've got a, we've got a helicopter. We've called in and, and, and there... We had to say, say goodbye to our little girl. And then take her and place her in that helicopter. We couldn't ride with her. Cindy, obviously, she had had a C-section, and she wasn't in any shape to be able to travel. So one of the deacons of the church that I was pastoring at that time put me in the car and said, let me drive you, Pastor. Man, you want to talk about crying out to God on that, on that trip to Tulsa. I prayed, and I said, oh, God, I never saw this coming. This was the happiest day of my life, my firstborn, my daughter. And now what's happening? It was a storm. Some of you face storms like that. And it was at that time that suddenly what church I pastored or the involvement of things that I was involved in, the community and, and all of that, didn't mean anything to me. There was a storm in my life. My boat was about to go down. And I need to put Jesus in control. And I said, Master, you got to come. You got to help us. That's where many of you are at right now. You don't know. You, you're not sure. And your world's upside down. Reprioritize what's really important. That relationship with God number one, with family, number two. We, we, we've got, we're, we're, we're beginning to understand some things now in our life. It's through these storms in our life, and that's why I just thought on this birthday of my daughter, and oh, oh yeah, she made it. She, she's a beautiful, beautiful woman now. She's nine years old. Got a great family, great children, great husband. She's engaged in ministry. Every week is touching hundreds of women through what God is doing in her life. And I'm so proud of her. Happy birthday, sweetheart. But I go back to that day when I said, God, she's yours. I put her in your hands. You're in control. Why don't you do that in your life right now? Why don't you put God in control? Why don't you go to him and say, Master, I need you right now. It may have nothing to do with the coronavirus. It may be an addiction. It may be a marriage problem. It may be a health problem. Or you're just away from God and you know that and you need to come back to him. Why don't you come back to him right now? Why don't you go to where he's at? He's ready to speak a word to you today. You can be secure in his power. He can speak to the winds and the waves, to the coronavirus. He can speak to the situation in your life. Let him do that right now. The Bible says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. If you need Christ in your life, I want to pray with you. Email me, prayer at cornerstonefresno.com. Put it there in, in the chat room. And, oh, God bless you for so many of you that now this is, you, you're, you're beginning to recognize you're secure in his power. You're secure in his power. 
Storms are raging, yes, but you're secure in his power. You're not sheltered in, in place and fear and doubt and despair. No, you are sheltered. You are secure in his power if you'll make him the master of your life. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I pray for individuals. I pray for those that, again, the enemy has tried to get us to shelter in fear and doubt and despair. But today, God, we recognize, I don't care how big the storm is on the outside or how unsure the future may be. We may think we're about to go down, but God, we know that you're in our boat. You're with us. We're calling out to you, Lord God. And we stand in reverence and amazement today that you can speak and the winds and the waves obey. Speak into our lives, God, and we will obey in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Nate? Uh, he's so right. We are secure in his promise. We want you to leave with that today, that you're secure in his promise because of his power. It's what God is doing in your life, he's doing it right now. And so thankful for that word today. Can I tell you that we're thankful for you? And for you watching, we've been able to see the comments, all the amens, the chiming in, even the prayer requests where people are going back and forth. Thank you for doing that. Can I tell you though that we have another service right after this? The reason why I tell you that is because somebody else needs to hear this word. This isn't just a word for you at 9 a.m. This is a word for somebody else at 11 a.m. Text somebody right now, like literally. Text somebody, get on your phone, get on your social media accounts and share this because you can make a difference in somebody's, somebody else's life today because they need hope. They need to know that they're secure in his power. Again, we've got a service tonight at 6 p.m., a service right after this at 11 a.m. and all the other services that we got going through the week. We appreciate you. We miss you. We love you. And we believe that the best is still yet to come from this point forward. God bless you, Cornerstone. See you guys at next service.